Lord, today we can thank you from the bottom of our hearts for the faith of our fathers. Imperfect though all parents are, they gave us faith, Lord God. They hauled us off to church and cleaned our smudges with a little spit. They did all that they had to do to plant you somewhere within an unruly child. And Lord, here we are today. So I thank you for that, Lord God. Bless our folks, the ones that are still with us and those who have come to be with you. We thank you for them, for their influence in our lives and for their love for this country. Bless us in all these understandings and hear our worship, Lord God, we ask in your precious name. Amen. Let's stand up for this one. Sing out great that.
sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Lord, how wonderful and great you are. In our day to day, Lord, we get so busy and distracted and we can forget just how wonderful and great and engaged you are with us. We ask your forgiveness for those times that we're just let the world encumber upon us and, and we forget how great and wonderful you are and who you are to us and who we are to you. How wonderful and how great you are, Lord. We have a future and a hope because of who you are. Because of your greatness, your goodness, and because you epitomize love. There is no love before there was you. How great and wonderful you are. Bless us, Lord. Forgive us for the things that we don't do well. Receive and hear our prayer and our praise and our adoration today. As we pray now the prayer that you taught the disciples, Our Father, Father who, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom, kingdom come, come thy, will thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from hell. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. I visited America yesterday. The America so many people don't know, and that so many people don't want to know. Boy, it was just so evident where I was. I thought there are some people who have no idea that this exists. Hundreds of people, probably 300 or could have been 400, all ages and shapes and sizes and backgrounds. And they had this in common. They were polite and kind and welcoming to a complete outsider. I think about half of them were outsiders. And they were all heartbroken at the loss of their friend or uh, a friend's loss. The businesses in town on the way in there, they all had signs that said closed 10 to 1 Friday. That was the time that, that there would be a service in town there. They had it at the fire hall, which we've done here when we knew that there wasn't a church big enough. And they have three churches, three nice churches in town that are well attended. Orange balloons, I started seeing orange balloons when I got close to the place. Just orange balloons kind of bouncing around outside of places. And that was this little boy's favorite color. As I took it all in at the overpacked fire hall, I was grateful for this America where faith and tragedy cross paths they know each other and well. I'll just share this with you because it's worth knowing. Owen T. Steckler, 12 years old, from Buffalo, North Dakota, passed away on Sunday, June 28th, due to an ATV accident near his home. He was born May 1st, 2008 at Fargo, North Dakota to Brian and Amanda Steckler. Owen was going to enter the sixth grade in the fall. Owen is a bright, fun-loving, adventurous kid. He had a great passion for life. He loved the outdoors, hunting, fishing, just like so many of our kids here, or just hanging out with his family and his dog, Twix. He also loved shooting pool when the weather would not cooperate. He had a huge and kind heart and would do anything to not see somebody hurting. Owen was diagnosed with limb girdle muscular dystrophy, LGMD2, lowercase e, two years ago. I remember that. 
And even when faced with the challenges of this, he never let up. He never let it keep him from enjoying life and living every minute to its fullest. He had a nice family that, that made sure of that as well. This disease was the start of the most amazing journey for Owen. He was able to go on a once of a lifetime, once in a lifetime deer, turkey, and pheasant hunt. He took trips to Hawaii, New Jersey, and New York, and in November 2019, Owen received gene therapy treatment for LGMD2E through a clinical trial at Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio. Yes, I'm proud of that. This will hopefully lead to the cure for his type of muscular dystrophy and help many kids with his diagnosis. Owen is a true hero and an incredible inspiration to all that have met him in this in his short but full life. And that was sure evident, all the people that were there, all the people that were there. He's the hero of Buffalo, North Dakota, and the apple of Grandma's eye. And certainly should be. We want to sing a song I think we sang last week. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage of sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, 
and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Amen. And in the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for you, and for his sake God forgives you all of your sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God, and he bestows upon them the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Praise God for First reading for today is from Zechariah 9, 9 through 12. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you. Triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall, we, shall be cut off, and he shall command peace to nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Today I declare that I will restore you double. Thank you, Lord God. God intends for his beloved family to live in loving harmony and he will see to it. If it helps to know, the date of this writing is 400 years prior to Jesus' arrival, riding down into Jerusalem precisely as this described. And there's no less cause for this celebration today. Amen? Romans 7, 15 through 25, what an important letter that all of us should <clears throat> refer back to often. Very, very important chapter 8, but all of it's important. The Apostle Paul said, I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want to do. But I do the very thing that I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good. But in fact, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. Very important to understand this. We are changed persons when we receive Jesus Christ into our hearts and are determined to live for him. We are changed. For I know that nothing good dwells within me that is in my flesh. <clears throat> I can will what is right, but I cannot do it every day, every moment, every hour. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do, and I would add sometimes. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me, because we are new in Christ. Put a thumb there. Because God has made us more like him. So I find it to be the law that when I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inmost self, in his personhood. But I see in my members another law at work with the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man I, that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's where we have to put our sin, right there. The Gospel of Matthew 11, 16 through 19, 25 through 30. Jesus spoke to the crowd saying, To what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another. We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We wailed and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking and they say, He has a, a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors, a sinner. 
<laughs> Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. At this time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And that is the holy word of God. Lord, thank you for the easy yoke. And thank you for the wisdom, the truth that is vindicated by your deeds and our deeds. Bless us in all of these understandings. Precious Jesus, amen. Please be seated. The yoke, and Jesus made several of them as a carpenter. The yoke was, he's referring to as the yoke that was then balanced, the heavy yoke, the heavy half of the yoke went over the ox, and the light part of it, the light other end of it, went over the beast that was being trained to walk, just to tread out the grain, just to walk in a circle, so boring. And these were animals that wanted to do it at their speed and speed up, but the little one walked right alongside the big one and had the light yoke upon him. The heavy burden was on the elder. And that's what Jesus is describing for us. His yoke is his yoke, ours. Not such a burden. When it becomes necessary during the normal course of human history that a specific group of people find it undeniable that they must completely end their relationship with another group and assume in this world an equal, separate, and sovereign status among nations which the laws of God entitle all mankind. Common and decent respect for humanity compels that group of people to clearly and publicly declare their reasons which have forced them to end the relationship in question. I'm not supposed to break up with a text, I'm breaking up with you. We hold the following truths to be obvious and undeniable. All men are created equal and have been equipped and supplied by the Creator with certain rights that cannot and must not be taken away, which include personal freedom, liberty, and the right to pursue happiness. To secure these God-ordained rights, governments are created and they derive their power and authority from the from the people they govern who give them permission to govern and willingly submit to their authority. However, when any government decides to take away the right of personal freedom in the pursuit of happiness, it is the right of the people under the government to change the government or, if necessary, get rid of the government altogether, to recreate a government which are once again founded upon the principles of freedom and organized in such a way as to guarantee those freedoms. Logic, caution, and good judgment requires that established governments should not be altered hastily without good reason or for temporary circumstances. As well, experience has demonstrated that the people have a tendency to suffer government evils rather than change them, as long as the suffering is not too extreme. Why? Because people get used to things being a certain way, and it is difficult and takes great effort to change. We have to be mindful of that. People to defeat the castaway and cast away the government, I'm sorry. But even a long series of abuses and stealing of freedoms has occurred by the government which are still meant to achieve the goal of putting the people under the rule of violent tyrants. When, when this happens, it is the right of the people even more, it becomes the duty of the people to defeat and cast away that government and create a new government and new safeguards to protect their freedom. This is what has happened to the 13 colonies who have been patient in the matter of suffering. 
The colonies have reached a point where they have no choice but to alter their current system of government because their freedoms have been abused. The King of England has a long history of reoccurring abuses and seizing freedom by violent threats. The King has one single objective, to take absolute dictatorial control over the colonies. To prove this, consider the following facts, which we make public for the whole world to evaluate. The King has refused to sign into law a system where courts administer justice. The King has forbid his governors to pass urgent laws that are extremely important to us. They must delay the laws and get the king's permission first. Even when the governors sus suspend the laws, the king still neglects to consider them anyway. The king has refused to sign or consider other laws that enact provisions for large groups of people unless those people give up their right to be represented in the government. In other words, they must give up their freedom to get the king to pass the law, something only a tyrant would do, would ask the people to do. I'm listening close here. The king has called the government leaders together in unusual and uncomfortable places, far from any legal resources or public records, for the sole purpose of making them so tired and uncomfortable they will simply agree with the king and do what he wants. The king has repeatedly shut down parts of the government that represent the people. Why? Because they have opposed him when he has abused the rights of the people they represent. The king has refused for long periods of time to allow other representatives of the people to be elected after he himself dissolved their representation. So the representatives who simply cannot walk away and forget those who they represent or their duties have returned to the people to do their service. Meanwhile, the country remains exposed to invasion by other countries and intense turmoil and uncertainty from within. The king has tried to prevent people from coming to live in our states obstructing laws that allow foreigners to become citizens, refusing to sign laws that encourage foreigners to migrate to this country, and making new laws that make it more difficult to own or buy land here. The king has hindered the administration of law and justice by refusing to allow us to create courts and appoint judges. The king has appointed his own puppet judges who, do, who, who will do nothing except what the king says to do. If not, he will remove them from office or just not pay them. The king has created many new public offices in order to send large groups of government officials to harass the people and take their wealth. This is starting to sound way too familiar. Huh. The king has kept his battle-ready armies living among us even in times of peace without our permission or agreement. The king has declared that his army is not subject to our laws or authority. Hmm. The king has agreed to make us subject to the laws and authority of foreign governments and disregarding our own laws, he gives his agreement to foreign lawmakers. The king houses or feeds large armies within our civilian population. The king protects his armies from any punishment or persecution by fake trials, even if they are guilty of murdering our citizens. The king has cut off our trade with other parts of the world. He has imposed taxes on us without our permission or, or agreement. He often refuses our citizens the benefits of a trial by jury. The king will transport our citizens across the ocean and put them on trial for pretend violations of the law. The king has abolished our government in one area only to set up his own government. Then the king will enlarge the territory this new government is responsible for and claim that the citizens of this expanded area are now under the absolute rule of the government the king set up. The king has taken away our government agreements, dismissed our most valuable laws, and fundamentally changed the way we govern ourselves by suspending our legislators and declaring that the king and his representatives now have the power to make law in all cases. He has disowned and dismissed our government, declaring that we are no longer under his protection as he wages war against us. He has robbed our overseas trade, destroyed our coastal economy, burned our communities, and ruined the lives of our people. The king at this very moment is sending large armies of foreign soldiers of death to complete the work of destroying us, of ruining our country and establishing his tyranny over us. The king acts with a cruelty and betrayal that has seldom been matched in even the most barbaric of times actions that are totally unworthy of being a ruler in a civilized world.
The king has captured our citizens while out at sea and has forced them to fight against their own country and to kill their friends and family or face death. At every stage of our suffering and oppression under this king, we have humbly repeated, repeatedly, officially, and publicly asked for the ceasing of this oppression and the correction of these abuses. Our requests have been met only with further injury and insult. A king who has this type of character and morals is defined in only one possible way, a tyrant unfit to rule free people. We have never failed to warn or inform our British brethren from time to time. We tell them about the attempts of the king and their government to extend their territory over us. We remind, we, we remind them of the reason why we left England to come to this new country. We have tried to appeal to their own sense of, ju of justice and goodness and have sincerely asked them, based on our common ties of ancestry and family, to not agree with or cooperate with these violations of our freedom, which deny that we are a separate nation we now consider our brethren in England, as we do all people of the world, enemies if we are at war and friends if we are at peace. Therefore, as a representative, as the representatives of the United States of America, we, the General Congress, have assembled and prayed to God about the honor and rightness of our conclusions, publish and declare with grave seriousness by the name and authority of the people of these colonies the following. The United States have the right to freedom and are free and independent. We denounce and separate ourselves from all authority or allegiance to the King of England. And we dissolve any political agreements or connections between America and Britain. As free and independent states, we have the full right and authority to declare war, make peace arrangements, build alliances with other countries, establish trade and commerce with the world, and do anything else that free and independent countries have the right to do. In support of this declaration, we rely on God to protect and provide for us. Together, we all promise our lives, our wealth, and our honor as we pledge to uphold the honor and honor this Declaration of Independence. Signed by 56. Americans. Amen. I won't make it a habit of reading to you from such lengthy things, but that's worth hearing, isn't it? And in simple terms, I mean, beautiful, lovely poetry in the way that it was written, but in simple terms. Is this important today? I'm thinking more than any other 4th of July. The narrative du jour, that's one of the first words a boy learns when he starts a date. Honey, if you see soup du jour, it isn't du jour soup, it's the soup of the day. So you know how to you know, look like a smart guy. The narrative du jour is shame on you. I don't find shame on me or shame on you in any of today's readings. The definition of shame is identifying with a flaw and defining my personhood thusly. This flaw, that's who I am. Did you hear Paul say that? No. This flaw was a result of the fallen humanity and the sin Sin body. We all got one. There's one thing I would urge you or invite you to be ashamed of, and that is if you imagine that you are superior to and more important than any other living soul, well, we are, we are just better because blah, 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 blah. The person who is superior in their own imagination for any reason should be very ashamed. So there it is. If you are superior because you're woker, whiter, blacker, richer, smarter, thinner, churchier, more popular, your chosen premise, I'm better, is idiotic. 
and I hope you're ashamed. Enough to crawl out from under it and wake up. Shaming is the tool of the weak mind and fodder for weak arguments. People use shaming on others to control and demean them, and those who attempt to shame you are pretty sure it'll work, usually because they themselves have been shamed and likely still are. Don't fall for it. Everybody's getting on the bandwagon that only one kind of life matters. Don't fall for it. Shaming is an assault on your personhood. Don't fall for it. From anybody, you ought to be ashamed. You better be telling me something I really ought to be ashamed of because if you're not, then I'll try not to shame you as I answer you. Your personhood and mine is in Christ who made us in his likeness. Where is shame? And then he redeemed us from our sin curse to make us all the more like him. Those still contending with the flesh, our sin nature, that's our personhood. The idiots even tried to shame Jesus. He is from Beelzebub. <laughs> oh, is he? The devil? Notice Jesus wasn't too flustered when they said that to him. He knew the condition of men and women. He knew they, that we were practiced sinners. And even when they said that to him, he was kind as they were impugning him and they knew better. He said, you know, if you have a, basically if you have a problem with the human me, that's one thing but you have defamed the Holy Spirit. And there won't be a, a forgiveness for that. And notice what they were impugning him with. They were assaulting Jesus' personhood. Dangerous game, indeed. You know how you defeat a people? You destroy their will. And you teach them that they don't matter. And you destroy their personhood. And when that is gone, hope vanishes with it. They become hopelessly dependent upon another person's opinion. Don't fall for it. I invite anyone to feel ashamed if they feel superior racially, culturally, or otherwise. It's just that delusion that murders, maims, innocence, and takes advantage of weaker people. And until we wake up and accept God's measure of who we are, we can fall prey to the smallest, the shrillest voice. Here's something encouraging. You know what Jesus took to the cross with him? He took your shame. He took the shame of, our, of the lostness of the world. He took our shame with him. That means it has no business being in you. Because of free will, that freedom from shame is exchangeable. It's in layaway and we can claim it or we can leave it. It's there for us, along with salvation, it's there for us to take. But we have to kind of grow into that, you know? I think when we receive Jesus, we still feel ashamed of the things that we've done. But the, the truth of it is, and he will show you, if you're sensible enough, <laughs> He will show you, I've already taken care of that. I've forgiven that. Let it go. The enemy will climb on you still to remind you of your worst deeds, the deeds that God has said. Those don't matter to me anymore. I'm using them to strengthen you so that you understand others who have also fallen. Amen? It's common for the nicest of people to still feel guilty about things that God has said, look, I've thrown them in the deepest sea, the sea of forgetfulness. I'm not even remembering them. Quit reminding me of them. That's the God I know. It's in layaway. We can claim it or we can leave it. We can claim it and return to it. The father of lies knows just the lie to tell you to get you to doubt your personhood. To doubt your freedom from shame. Don't fall for it. Lord, the press is all over this, shaming people because they were born white. 
shaming people for things that anything they can invent in order to get us to all hang our heads, put on a mask, wonder if we're dirty. And I thank you, Lord, that you have put us in white raiment. You have saved us from our sin nature, even though it will drag, we will drag it to the coffin with us, Lord. There it stays in the ground as our perfect soul comes to you. Thank you for loving us in ways that we have a full-time job loving others equally as you have loved us. But thank you, Lord, that you constantly, 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 constantly burden our hearts to give that same love to others that you pour into us. And I thank you that we're pretty good at it. Not perfect, but pretty good. Bless us in that, Lord. That'll be our prayer today. Not only to watch after and to guard and to keep our loved ones safe, but to help us love perfectly in this life, just as you love perfectly, 24 and 7. We love you, Lord. We thank you. I thank you for this these people that are here today, Lord God, I wouldn't trade this group of people for any group of people you could send. Thank you. Bless them. Be glorified in what we say and do. And we pray these things in your holy and wonderful and precious name, Jesus. Amen. friend Candace. She's a pastor um, in a small, small town up north of us. <clears throat> she used to work at the hospital. That's where I would encounter her often. And she wrote, morning has broken and she is beautiful. As she turns on the day's light, the magic of last night's rain is revealed. The dust has disappeared and in its place is a freshness that comes only from the giver, capital G, 
of earth's sustenance. All living things need renewal, the trees and flowers, the corn and wheat fields, as well as those who tend this amazing garden of beauty and blessing that has been entrusted to us. Every now and then we need to wash away the dust that is gathered on the things our mind seems to harbor, as though they were friends, when in fact they are over, they've overstayed their welcome and their time to leave our thoughts is long overdue. Independence Day seems like the perfect time to renew and experience the feeling of freedom that quenches a thirsty spirit. As the earth patiently waits for the gratefully and for waits for and gratefully accepts the life-giving rain, so too should we accept the gift of the giver, knowing that in accepting that which refreshes our spirit, we are renewed and we grow in a way that allows us to enjoy the garden. Thank you, giver of life, for sustenance. Amen. A very prolific pastor. <laughs>